so next, I and I hope we can uh, discuss that more in the panel discussion later uh, later today. Uh, our next talk is is by uh, Beto Katsar from um, University of Wisconsin Madison, who will tell us about ancient biological signatures and uh, the lessons that uh, life as it arose on Earth might have uh, for our life as it might arise elsewhere. Thank you for having me. I, I find it very curious that we, we have some, some sense that we understand what life is on this planet. So we try to imagine life as we don't know it. When I think we actually have not uncovered a lot of the mysteries about life on this planet. And that's the sort of the, at the center of my research program. Try to learn from life that evolved on this planet by reconstructing its past and potentially by accessing extinct Bio biology that wants to go on this planet. Take any chunk of gas or rock right present in the universe, and you will be able to study the, uh, ke the chemistry or the physics or the geology of this place. But this is the only place where you can be a biologist, so I'm really excited to be a biologist on the, on the only known planet where you can be one. All right, uh, yeah, there you go. All right, so there are two particular questions that I wish to explore today. One is that how we can use life as we know it to recreate what life looked like throughout past Earth. And by that, I mean really our own alien past. And second, there are recent studies that tries to get into what lies between life versus non-life and, and whether we should even worry ourselves about trying to access to exactly what happened on this planet when it comes to origin of life or whether we can think about more creative possibilities when it comes to understanding this transition. First problem is, is seemingly straightforward. Assuming that going from some sort of, I guess, a simplified view that was what you're looking into here, an organized behavior that is sustaining itself, that's evolving, that's life as we think of it, to an integrated system that, that we think of Earth and life, right? So at this point, we are not thinking about origin of life, but we're at this point, hypothetically, first cell evolved, you're thinking about what happened since the emergence of the first cell to basically the rest. How did this organization took, out, took over an entire planet? And I'm going to give you a few highlights here as to what happened and why we should not assume that we have uncovered everything that ever existed on this planet. Our planet is about 4.5 billion years old. It's a, it's a very living system. Life happens to this place rather rapidly given and take four billion years is the age of our first cell. And when we think of ancient life, even the most educated people who think about these things, like by perhaps imagining some extinct organisms, dinosaurs, or tapping into that sort of ancient diversity. And we have some narrative about what happened to dinosaurs and how they got extinct, right? But give me any molecule that, that really enabled life as we know it, any protein, any metabolism that you can think of, and I'm going to tell you that we do not know how these molecules or proteins originated, evolved, or may have gone extinct. So there's zero narrative about any protein and truly how it originated on this planet at first place. Zero. I think that's an incredible knowledge gap in the way we think about life. And, and really the extinction that we're thinking about here is Precambrian prior to the organisms that we can relate to or understand in the rock record more reliably compared to others. So the first question is then how, the, how has biochemistry evolved? And why does this matter? Why should we care about this? And we listened to two really good talks in the beginning. I think that did a great opening to what I'm about to present to you. Let's, let's just go through what, what um, our planet has gone through. That this, everything that we study, medicine, really you know, whatever we can think to when it comes to modern biology comes from biochemistry that we know and study today. But bio, there's a biochemistry that nobody knows on this planet, and that's, that's really what has gone extinct, and that's really what we're trying to tap into. And not necessarily by doing creative chemistry, but by learning from molecules that, and organisms that survive today. There, about half of this planet's history, there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, so there's about 2 billion years of microbial history on this planet that managed to survive without it. With the rise of oxygen, you can imagine that whatever that could not tolerate this molecule as tried, basically, that couldn't survive, and likely there's some molecular level extinction that happened at that place, at that phase. And then we are moving on to major glaciations throughout Earth's history, and then heat fluctuations, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of planetary change and environmental change that happened that impacted life 
uh, throughout its history. And that's what we are trying to understand. And not just necessarily by for finding life, but I really don't think that there's going to be any way that we can tap into this unless we scale, we bridge these two scales at what's happening at the mo- that will, it comes to evolution and also uh, connecting this to planetary scales of signatures. All right, so that's where we come in, that, that, that really trying to develop this understanding of planetary biology by co- creating a sort of a smoothie. We don't call it in, in, at NASA, we think of this interdisciplinary work as not a fruit salad, but a smoothie to really get these disciplines integrated with one another. We rely on uh, microbiology, a lot of geochemistry and evolutionary biology, and a lot of computational tools in order to create synthetic genes and then introduce them to modern organisms by and reprogram them, a modern organism and their behavior. All right, so how do we do this? We may be familiar with the phylogenetic trees, and when we access any node that is present on the tree by using modern uh, biological diversity, we are still trapped within the histories of these systems. And even through ancestral state reconstructions or sequence reconstructions, we are accessing whatever modern biology can offer. So it is not really getting into the extinction that I'm talking about. What, we, what we're really trying to get into and that we should think about is, is the shadow of sort of lineages that also likely existed and different alternatives to life as we know it that simply didn't survive the test of time and not a fault of their own either, right? That there could be a lot of things that did not let their survival that, that is not necessarily due to fitness because of everything that is selected is due to beneficial reasons. All right. I will present two quick examples. We applied this to biological carbon cycling and nitrogen fixation. Both are very ancient. Both are obviously very important for life as we know it. We have nitrogen in, in pretty much every molecule in our system. We depend on carbon, and that's the biological record is what we track when we think about the oldest organisms and when we track their geochemistry on this planet. What we've done briefly is, is basically reconstructing through reconstructing the ancestral DNA for uh, proteins that encode for these metabolisms. We then compare and contrasted these values with whatever is inferred and recorded from uh, reconstructed from the rock record. Uh, and in this case, I'm particularly referring to uh, carbon and nitrogen isotope biosignatures that are coming directly from the rock record. So at the one level, geology provides some sort of record, but at the another level, biology also does so, especially using synthetic biology. So the approach is somewhere, something like this. We access ancient DNA using synthetic biology and evolutionary reconstruction. We then go inside the microbial systems because, you know, life is a microbial thing, like it or not. I mean, if you don't like bacteria, this is not a good planet for you, right? The, the whole show is run by microbes here. They engineer microbial genomes with these ancient DNA by getting rid of whatever is co- contemporary, whatever is modern uh, DNA is gone. All right, so now these organisms depend and they need this ancient DNA to function. And in our case, these d- DNA molecules are, they could be as old as 3, 3.5 billion year old. So we're not talking about uh, recovering DNA from ice. They will be at least, I don't know, maybe 40, 50,000 years if I'm generous, but when we think about ancient life, we are really thinking deep time. After reprogramming select organisms, we then measure their behavior. And I don't know what's going on on this slide, sorry about that, but this, this is supposed to be a phylogenetic tree. We've engineered diazotrophs, these are nitrogen fixing bacteria, as well as cyanobacteria. Uh, they, these are great pets actually for us, so we could do a lot of genome engineering in them. Let's jump to the conclusion here. We've applied this to a very sort of celebrity protein that I like to think of as Rubisco, sort of the prime carbon fixing molecule, not the only one. And I'm not saying here that this is the enzyme that determines the entire carbon, biological carbon record in, in, on this planet, but it surely is one of the primary ones, given that it catalyzes the rate determining step. It's the most highly expressed and it is present in the Krebs cycle and so on and so forth. So by reconstructing ancient Rubisco and then reintroducing it to carbon fixing organism like cyanobacteria, we were then able to reconstruct. There you go. Uh, just, just presenting some data here where we grew these engineered microorganisms that contain ancient DNA under air and higher CO2 concentrations to see to what degree we can manipulate the carbon isotope fractionation that is generated by, that could be attributable to the ancient DNA that we introduced given that that's the system that we created in the lab. We found that when it comes to carbon record, it's very difficult to, to break through that uh, value that we know exists. 
through rock record and through geochemistry, which is in a way perfect news for us. That really re-emphasizes that carbon isotope biosignatures, as well as nitrogen isotope biosignatures, seem to be very robust to evolutionary change, and they are reliable when it comes to tracking life's record on this planet and likely beyond. We are applying this variety of different enzymes. As I mentioned before, give me any enzyme you can think of. Could be, I don't know, hemoglobin, something that we can think of maybe relevant to our bodies versus a, a more metabolic a microbial protein. And I will tell you that we don't have a narrative about its origin and evolution on this planet. So forget about life as we don't know it beyond. We don't even know it for here. All right, and so you're looking at a variety of different examples. These are especially metal-loving enzymes. They, they bind to molybdenum, copper, iron, whatever this earth provided. And, and obviously we think of metals differently than astronomers in biology. Life has been so good at using little crumbles and turning it into empires, okay? So we, like really what you're looking at is metallo enzymes that shape atmosphere as we know it, that assemble them together through, from nothing. So we're thinking alternative biochemical origins but through our explorations. I can, I can, I'm pretty confident that there's no need that we should assume that the early ancestors of proteins and metabolisms that we study today resembled how they are like right now. For instance, with nitrogenase, we are finding that ancient nitrogenases likely were different than nitrogenases that we know. Uh, therefore, we need to think differently when it comes to the, the, the predecessors of a modern biology that we study. And I think uh, synthetic biology is excellent. When it comes to creating alternatives, we may never be truly able to tap into exactly what's happened. I think that will be a crazy claim to say that we're gonna be able to resurrect everything that ever happened on this planet, but we will be able to stretch N equals one to N equals a little bit more than one by thinking creatively and engineering molecules that, that are inspired by modern biology and constraints by ancient geochemistry, yet exhibit different novel behaviors. We should be looking for internal chemical flexibility, robust uh, catalytic scaffolds, nitrogen and carbon it seems to be functionally robust. Um, and, and I think sort of looking into these multiple variables when it comes to uh, biosignatures will be wise here. And that they lo looks like these two are at least from what we understand are universal markers. The second uh, topic that I want to touch on very briefly is understanding the transition between life versus non-life. So now we're not thinking about cells and beyond, right? So that the cell evolved and, and then originated and then evolved, but we're going backwards in time a little bit more, thinking about from this misty chemistry, how did life the organized, and again, simplified view I'm showing here, evolved from building blocks, however you may think of them. And it, we understand now, I think, that field moved forward from trying to understand how these building blocks originated and evolved at first place. We understand that variety of different environments and geochemical settings can give rise to these building blocks, all right? So we, we are able to start simulate lightning, heat, electricity, and able to get a pool of different building blocks in the lab. That doesn't seem to be the problem. The problem is to understand how a variety of different building molecules can act together in a way that looks like life, right? It's the living behavior that is, that is, I think, the big question mark that the field is really pushing uh, through right now. That how do you get these molecules to behave in a way that they're evolving and they're attributing a lifelike property? And that's not a very, that's a difficult problem, right? Because you have to understand whatever that you're looking into. It could be some sort of camera. You are sending some sort of rover with a camera and sending you an image like this. We will all be scratching our heads and thinking, oh my God, is this, is this, what is this? Is this living? There's a pattern, there's some behavior. It's acting like something that I can relate to as a living system. But we know that obviously these sort of behaviors can exhibit, uh, can be exhibited through completely abiotic uh, settings like that or catalytic systems. And we have to think about false positive biosignatures very carefully, of course, it's very important. And what makes life incredible is that at every layer, there is some sort of autocatalytic pattern that you can find. It could be all the way down from metabolism. If you scale this up to organismal level, there is some sort of repetition and, and feeding behavior and pattern across many, many cycles. But we are sort of abstracting this in the very, very simplified form, thinking about autocatalytic cycles. How does an input turn into a product that then catalyzes itself, that self-sustains and feeds itself? So we're trying to understand how this repetition happened in the origin of life field. 
And this is important, right? It's important if you think about some sort of population of rabbits and wolves versus some sort of chemical A and chemical B. You're looking at some complex population dynamics. They're a parasitic and host system that is feeding, competing, stealing from each other, cooperating. Biology does this, organisms and populations do it, molecules do it too. So we're looking for that sort of behavior at the molecular level, that, that nonlinear behavior. And I think that that's really what we need when it comes to understanding um, early patterns and early evolution. It also so, sort of moves us beyond thinking about building blocks and should I be looking at compound X or compound Y? Is there a smoking gun? No, there is no single smoking gun, right? It's gonna be a bunch of different chemicals reacting in a way and, behave, and interacting in a way that could be attributable to life. And that's good news, I think, for life search. So that pushes us beyond just looking for single molecules or chemistries, but a variety of different molecules interacting with one another. I think, I think this is actually very positive for our field. So what we've done is that rather than searching for adequatotic cycles, this is great in theory. However, we know that there are very few cycles like this in, that, that are identified. Um, how can we engineer them from scratch or can we? We know they are rare, but we instead thought about another set of or form of reaction, a different redox reaction that is called comproportionation. In a very simple way, you can think about it as two oxidation states in, of two could be two molecules, could be two elements, and one out. And this product will have an intermediate redox state compared to the two inputs. And you're seeing here, there's a high redox state input, there's a low redox state input, and you're producing M, that's the intermediate product. And we did a thorough literature search, even uh, paid translators to read old Chinese papers to, to look into the sort of sets of reactions to see how many different redox reactions named as comproportionation that we can identify. And we found that, that there's actually over 260 possible adocatalytic reaction sets present throughout the periodic table. And they are all potentially capable of creating their own adocatalytic cycles through this interesting redox chemistry. We, we published this uh, a little over a year ago at JAX, made it to the cover, that was very exciting. And um, we created an entire library of reaction sets and we encouraged the community to go and check out uh, these reactions and look at your own interesting chemistry and see if you can find patterns within this system. And I think, again, because we're looking at complex dynamics, it's not the stuff that, that is on the planet. It is how this stuff interacts with one another, whether that stuff is able to persist over long periods of time and generating a memory that is then studyable. That's really what life is. So we're looking at the sort of complex dynamics, the biostability, mutualism, predation that is not happening at the large organismal level, but at the chemical level that I think will actually increase our chances of finding something more promising rather than searching for single molecules and arguing for years and years whether this molecule can be generated abiotically or biotically. I don't think that's going to take us far. All right. So if you want to explore ways that chemistry could be lifelike and completely different from life, this is one way. Let's think about the behavior of life and not necessarily all the nitty-gritty details of whatever those chemicals can be. I'm not saying that's not important, but I think life is more grandier than that. All right, and I want to end with this nice quote that, that inspires me by Isaac Asimov, that when we go out in the space, there may be more to meet us than we expect. I hope so. I would look forward not only to our ETU brothers or sisters who share life as we know it, but also some occasional weird cousins. And I'm, I'm interested in those weird cousins. Thank you so much. And I will leave you with this final remark. Uh, using life as we know it, we are creating how life may have looked like over geological history. We're using ancient metabolisms that we think are providing some universal markers to limits of life. And we should that point out that we should consider alternative molecular possibilities. At the same time, trying to go a step further by traveling even further back in time, understanding the transition between life and non-life will require looking into this sort of adocatalytic cycles and chemical networks and the feedback between them. They seem to be common than, or at least pr promising that they may be more common than we know. Um, and and the, while the molecules that constitute life not to be, the pattern themselves may be universal, and that, that's pretty promising for the field. Thank you. Okay.